Don't you just hate it when you start a new job and one of your new colleagues becomes immediately obsessed with you? They start following you home into the gym and this goes on for over five years. No? Well, this actually happened to a woman called Laura Black in the 1980s, immortalised in today's stalker movie, Stalking Laura. This is the first film I've done that's based on a true story, so I'll show you what these people actually look like at the end of this video. Like and subscribe, please. Thanks. Now, I'm calling this Stalking Laura, but I think the original title was I Can Make You Love Me, and it's also known as Fatal Proposal and the Stalking of Laura Black. So it starts with Laura sat around with a nice family who are all proud because she's got this great new job opportunity at KEI in Silicon Valley. Uh. <laughs> Some great 80s saxophone music plays as she drives from Virginia to California. And while I'd love to leave it playing, she's already arrived here in Sunnyvale. So at the KEI offices, this guy Chris is showing her around and telling her about how tight the company is on security. Then this guy comes out. Yep, this is Richard Farley. And he's not exactly keeping his cards close to his chest. The three of them go for lunch together and he can't stop staring at her. Within minutes of meeting her, he's invited her to a tractor pull. Thanks, but I really can't go. She finds a room to live with with this woman, joins the company's softball team, and everything seems to be going well. But on her second day, although she's arrived for work at 7am, she finds Richard in her office. He's been up all night baking her blueberry bread. That's a couple of red flags already, and it's 7am on day two. She's now doing some 80s aerobics, and what the fuck? He's watching her. She hasn't seen him, so when he approaches her in the car park, he pretends it's a coincidence, and asks her to go to a concert with him on Sunday. Again, she says no, but... Okay, well forget about the concert. What about dinner Saturday night? She says she doesn't think it's a good idea. Then he comes out with this gem. It's going to be real hard for us to have a relationship if you keep refusing to go out with me. She tells him the only relationship they're going to have is a professional one in the office. And after just three days, Richard is the epitome of toxic masculinity. Ooh. I don't think it's a good idea to wear such a sexy looking top in public. Excuse me? It might give people the wrong impression. Later at Laura's first game for the company softball team, Richard approaches her. He says he's been thinking about the terms of their relationship and he'd like to discuss them further over coffee after the game. We are not having a relationship. I am not going out with you. Now, I appreciate these events took place in the mid-80s, but surely it's time to report this. I can handle him. Oh, okay then. But she's laughing at him now, so he's in angry mode, and this does not bode well. Richard's next move is to go to the receptionist and ask her when exactly Laura's birthday is, as they know it's soon and they're planning a party. He's done this purely so he can look at the screen and find her address. Smart. So when she gets home that night, he's waiting outside her house with a gift. Because he felt she was being childish at the softball game by laughing at him, he's bought her a child's toy. He also gives her a letter, and the letter is ridiculous. Until I can ask you out nicely and have you say yes, I'll be around. What? If you really want to get rid of me, you're going to have to bite the bullet and let me take you out a few times. Her roommate tells her to report Richard, but she's like, No, I'm the only woman in the office, blah, blah, blah. So that's not happening. Later at drinks after another softball game, Laura is ignoring Richard. Number 26, uh, turkey and ham with cheese is their best. Um, I'll have uh, number 29. Thank you. Ooh, he didn't like that. So he's gone to her house and let all her tyres down. Even after admitting to this the next morning in the car park, he's still asking her out. R- relationships are a lot of work. Jesus. Right, finally Laura is reporting this now, but this personnel woman is suggesting it's her fault. Do you always smile at people that way? Unbelievable. So that's the end of that then. Back at the aerobics class and Richard has gone from watching to joining in. Even though the company has told him to stay away from her, they can't stop him doing what he wants in his free time. Richard's landlady, Nancy, who also works at KEI, gives him some advice when he starts talking about a weekend away he's planning with Laura. She's not interested. Ooh, he does not like that. Now, he's taking photos of her, and he's not even bothering to hide. Later, he's looking at the photos and writing letters to her. Uh Uh-oh, he's cutting her head out and doing some 80s photoshopping. Obsess much? This is just relentless. He's followed her to the gas station, and he's still asking her out. Obviously, she says no. When she gets home, she sees he's followed her again, so her and her roommate decide to find a new place with better security. At Richard's house, Nancy comes into his room and sees he's messing around with a gun, and she doesn't want guns in the house. I said I'd take care of it, Nancy. 
Later at work, Chris reminds Laura that if she wants this promotion, she needs to finish her application for higher security clearance. She says the company are asking for so much information, it's taking a long time. Richard stays late that night so he can go into her office, rub her desk and go through the trash. Oh God, what's he going to find? No, no, no. What a creep. Now he's screwdriving her desk open and going through her papers, and he's found all the information she had for her security application, including the addresses of her family members. Then he jumps out at her in the car park. New apartment's much nicer, more private. She says she's calling the police, so Richard starts dropping in information he's learned about her family. You try to run, I'll go after one of your sisters. Oh dear. Maybe even your mother. So that's the police off the table then. Ah, now it's Christmas and Laura's at home with her family in Virginia. A package has arrived from California and oh my God, what's this? Absolutely incredible. Laura explains to her family what's been going on. The takeaway here is that she's not prepared to quit her job as that would mean he's won. So she says this time she's going to make the company listen. I don't think so. But sadly, this personnel woman is an absolute joke. She's seen the letters, the gifts, and apparently Laura has witnesses. So what's the plan? Offer him (laughs) counselling. This sounds like the sort of crap that happens now. It's the 80s. Just fucking suck him. This woman also offers Laura counselling. Unbelievable. She even suggests that she gives up the aerobics class because Richard has joined them to stalk her. Nice. Laura later goes to a bar with friends and starts talking to this guy. When she goes to the bathroom, Richard is there. He's annoyed that he's had to do the counselling. Now he's getting seriously angry and making direct threats. So finally, and bear in mind this has been going on for months, if not years, the company is bollocking Richard. He says if he gets fired, he'll kill himself and take others down with him. Okay... And okay, apparently now that is enough and he has been sacked. Good. Good. But he's still following her. And to the work car park. He's even followed her out on a date. Her new boyfriend Sam sees him there and tells her she needs to take this a bit more seriously. So he gives her a gun. When Sam leaves Laura's house later, she hears a noise outside. Oh, it's all right. It's just Richard in her garage, leaving a note on her car. At work, Chris tells Laura that a promotion has been approved, but that the problems with Richard are holding up her security clearance. He suggests getting a restraining order, and she agrees. We next see Richard selling his car on the cheap for cash then spending that money on guns and a motorhome. Well, just be for me and my wife, Laura. Richard has driven the motorhome to his favourite place, the KEI car park, and he's ready for battle. Cowboys and Indians. Um, I think you mean cow people and indigenous peoples of the Americas, Richard. Anyway, he goes into the building and starts shooting indiscriminately at employees. Laura has her headphones on, so hasn't heard any of this until now, but it's too late. He's gone into her office and shot her. The police have arrived and are telling people not to enter the building, but Chris is an absolute hero and ignores them. Turns out Laura hasn't died from her injuries, but Richard is still outside shooting the place up and there's no way out for Laura. Richard goes back to Laura's office later and sees that she's not there, so he knows she's alive and somewhere in the building. Richard tells the hostage negotiator that this is all about Laura Black and that he has no intention of coming out. I'd rather kill people than animals. Laura has finally made it out of the building and blames herself for everything that's happened. After some negotiation, Richard finally agrees to end this and gives himself up. Chris has also survived. Yes! And Richard is still thinking about Laura. While Laura Black understandably keeps a low profile these days, she carried on working at the company for many years following the incident. Richard Farley was given the death penalty in 1992, but 30 years later, he's over 73 years old and still on death row in San Quentin. Nice. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe and check out this other video. Thank you.